Take your Bible, please. Turn to the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, and I cannot begin to tell you how blessed I am to prepare these messages for you at Sun Baptist Church. In fact, I'll tell you now, being able to do this every week has helped me become a much better preacher and Bible teacher. It's been a real blessing for me. And I can't wait in a few weeks when Marilyn and I are back there. And we will spend a few more days this time because last time, as you know, her brother, who is very, very ill, um, was right at death's door. He rallied after we got there, but we left early to be by his bedside. And I do appreciate, Marilyn appreciates all your prayers on his behalf. Now, in Isaiah chapter 43, I'm just going to give you a thumbnail sort of sketch. This prophecy, and it is a prophecy, was written a hundred years before the prophecy was fulfilled. And this is the prophecy. God tells Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 43, Israel has sinned against me, and they've rebelled. They have rebelled. I have no choice but to punish them because I love them. And remember, in the New Testament, in Hebrews, the Bible tells us that God chastises those whom he loves. One of the best ways that a father can prove that he loves his children or a mother for that matter, is when that father or that mother disciplines, punishes that child for wrongdoing. We have the reverse idea nowadays that somehow or another, if we don't <clears throat> chastise our children, discipline them, then they will know that we love them, maybe with a timeout. Uh, my mother and father didn't know what a timeout was. Maybe a time out was the time it took for them to get to the living room, to the dining room, where the belt was hanging that they were going to whip one of us boys with. Maybe that was their version of a time out. But punishment by father or mother is one of the very best ways we can know that father or that mother loves us. Really, in reality, that's just simply so. So God told Isaiah, the Jewish people have rebelled against me. As a result of that, I have no choice but to punish them. I'm going to take them into the land of Babylon, and they're going to be taken captive there. He didn't tell Isaiah, but they were to be there for 70 years. And then in his prophecy, he says, I'm going to let them go home. After I have let Babylon punish the Jews, wicked, evil Babylon, that's right. I'm going to use a wicked, evil country to punish the Jewish people that I love so dearly. And once I've let them go home from captivity, then I will destroy the Babylonians and then I will forgive the Jewish people and almost as a cherry on top of a ice cream sundae, he said then, once all of that has happened and they've been punished and they've been taken into captivity and then I've let them go home and I've destroyed the Babylonian people and I have forgiven them Here's the cherry on the Sunday. And then, I don't want them to think any longer and dwell on the sins that they committed that got them in that mess to start with. I don't want them to think about it anymore. On a very human level, I did with my two sons just as I described here, that God did with Israel. 
I told my two boys, if you do things that are wrong, I will punish you. If when they did those things wrong, I did not punish them, then I would not be a good picture of their heavenly father. And that's what I wanted to be, was a good picture of their heavenly father who always kept his word. But then unless it was an emergency situation, I would take whichever one of the boys had done wrong, I would take that son of mine into a, usually a bedroom and close the door so that nobody could see it or hear what was going on. I would explain in very simple terms the punishment and why I was going to have to punish him to be a good father. Then I'd have a prayer. Then I'd do the punishment. Then we'd have another prayer. And then I'd say to my son, son, this is the way the heavenly father does us. If we sin, he forgives us when we go to him. He may have to punish us before he forgives us. And if we do, we just have to suffer the punishment. But he does ultimately forgive us. And then he forgets it. So the last thing I tell my son before I release him to join his friends or his family is you did wrong. I told you ahead of time, if you did, I would have to punish you. I have punished you. You are forgiven. You are so much forgiven. Son, listen to me. If you do something else that is wrong tomorrow, or perhaps even the same thing that got you in trouble today, or if it's six months down the road, whatever it is, I will not bring this episode up to you. It's gone. It's gone. I may have to discipline you for the similar or same thing that got you in trouble this time or something entirely different. But this episode is gone. I won't ever bring it up again to you or to anybody else. It's gone because that's the way the Heavenly Father treats us. And so that is exactly what God was telling Isaiah. But see, here is the problem. Here is the problem. You and I have a tendency to regret things in our lives. I would be very surprised if there's not every single one of you, but that has something that you can bring to mind now that you regret. You regret something stupid, not necessarily sinful, that you did, that you wish you'd never done. You regret something good that could have happened to you. God could have let it happen, but didn't happen, and you regret it. You regret something awful that you said to somebody that you really, really love, and then they died before you ever went and asked them to forgive you. Or maybe there was something good you could have said to somebody that you love very, very much, and they died, and you never got to tell them something as simple as I love you. But everybody that's listening to me, including me, we all have some kind of regret. Here is the thing. God, once you're forgiven, does not want you to get stuck in that regret. He does not want you bringing that to mind day after day after day. Once you are forgiven, you are forgiven. That's exactly what he was trying to tell Isaiah. I'm going to have to punish Israel. I'm going to have to take them into captivity. Then I will destroy Babylon. I will, by that time, have let Israel return home the punishment will be over. I will have extended the grace of forgiveness. And then I don't want them to think about it anymore. The reasons they got into trouble to start with. The rebellion that they exercised against me. I don't want them to think about why 
they were punished. Now, I want you to notice something. This makes life have a little bit more sense to it. He told Isaiah, I will use Babylon, and then when I release the Jews to go home and the punishment's over, I will destroy Babylon. Now, think about that for a minute. What is God going to do in your life? He may use the very thing that hurts you the most about some stupid mistake you made. I heard somebody the other day say, I made such a stupid, idiotic mistake, a financial miscalculation. It got me into deep, deep, deep financial trouble. And I keep beating myself over the head. And I regret it. But then they went to God because it was actually because of a rebellion against God that caused them to make that stupid error. So what was God doing? God was using a financial situation that really, really, really hurt that person until they repented and came back to him and then God, through a miracle, destroyed the financial problem so that there was no financial problem in that person's life anymore. Do you understand what I'm saying? He let a problem be to that individual what Babylon was to Israel. He used a problem to bring that person to God. Do you get it? Sometimes God uses a sickness. We have a sickness. We think about something that caused that sickness. And then God uses that sickness to bring that person to God. And then he heals that person of that sickness and the sickness goes away. I had a woman a few years ago say, I am such an idiot. I became a chain smoker when I was a teenager. And now I'm paying for it. I've got all sorts of health problems. And I can't seem to quit being a chain smoker. And she was coughing and hacking and even crying when she was talking to me. But what God did, he used that illness that resulted from those cigarettes, that stupid decision she made, Years ago as a teenager, he used the illness that came from those cigarettes to actually bring her to himself. She probably would have never come otherwise, according to what she said. So she comes to God, and once she comes to God, she decides she's going to do the right thing. She finally is able to break that habit of chain smoking, but even before then, the doctors were almost miraculously, in fact, I think miraculously, able to heal her of a lung condition that she had, and now she's very, very happy. But here is the thing. Even once that man that had the financial problem and regretted his decision that got him the financial problem, once he was delivered of it and no longer had that financial problem and life was okay, he still was carrying around the regret that he talked about day after day after day of how stupid he was, even though he had been re re relieved of that financial problem. The same thing with this woman I'm telling you about. And it was on the cigarettes. I mean, there she was. She actually thought she was dying. She thought she had lung cancer. She didn't. But it was a very, very difficult breathing problem. But then all of a sudden, through the miracle that God made for us when he made medicine, through the skill of doctors, through the touch of God himself, she suddenly is off the cigarette. She's over the disease. But she still carries around the stupidity of what got her into the mess to start with. 
That is what God was telling Isaiah to tell Israel. Once I forgive you, once I've gotten you out of the punishment of Babylon, I don't want you running across in your mind day after day after day the regrets of what got you in that mess to start with. I don't want that to be your life. I just simply don't. You say, well, where is that in the Bible? There are all sorts of places. I mean, you take a look at Abraham. Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis is told, actually, when he was in Ur of the Chaldees, he's going to follow God. And at that time, you talk about a man that's out of the will of God. He wasn't a great man of faith. He didn't even know God. He was living in a pagan land. But God ends up making a promise to him that he's going to be the father of a great nation. Now think about this. When he is 75 years old, God gets around to telling Abraham, you're going to have a son and your son is going to be the father of a great nation. Son was Isaac. When he was 75 years old, I mean, that's old to start talking about having a baby. In fact, the Bible says Sarah laughed at it. And then Abraham did something that I guess all of, of us who are men have done at one time or another. That is, he listened to his wife, and most of the time when we listen to our wives, we are better off. But this time, his wife gave him some really bad, bad advice. I don't see Marilyn giving me this kind of advice. She said, I got a girl that works for me. I can't have a baby. Sleep with her. She gets pregnant. That'll be the baby of promise. Because we're not going to have a baby. We're too old. That was dumb advice. And the idiot Abraham was at that time, he did it. We have paid for it down to this day, folks. I mean, we have paid for it down to this day. What are you talking about? The baby that was born to Hagar, her handmaid, was Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of the Arabs. Isaac is the father of Jews. What do you think all that fighting is about over there? Take it back far enough. Ishmael is the father of the Hamas, the Palestinians. Isaac is the father of the Jews. Look at the mess they got into over there. But that promise was made when he was 75 and he and Sarah decided we're going to help God. You go in there and sleep with that handmaid, she'll get pregnant. God let him know really quick that was not the child of promise. Ishmael was not. But it wasn't until 25 years later when Abraham is 100 years old that Isaac is finally born. And think about that for a minute. Think about it. Don't you believe that many was the day that Abraham and Sarah regretted that little overnight issue with Hagar? And yet, in spite of all that, you get over to John chapter 8, and Jesus is talking and says, Abraham saw my day and was glad. He told a bunch of religious idiots over there, Abraham saw my day and was glad. Abraham, are we talking about Abraham who pulled that shenanigan, shenanigan by staying overnight with a girl that ended up, she got pregnant? Are we talking about that Abraham? Yep. Because he looked past to the point of God's forgiveness and he learned his lesson real well because when God asked him to offer Isaac that child of promise, the Bible said he rose up early the next morning to go do it. If God had told me to sacrifice one of my children, I wouldn't have gotten up and gotten on the road real quick. I'd have drunk an extra cup of coffee. I'd have gotten on the phone, made some telephone calls. I'd have read an extra page in the newspaper. I'd have dragged myself. But the Bible says he got up early in the morning. Why? Because it says that Abraham... 
knew now that God could be depended upon. He knew God could be depended upon. I mean, after all, 100 years old, and he had Isaac to start with. Well, if he can do that, he can bring Isaac from the dead if I do end up killing my son. What about Moses? Moses down in the land of Egypt. And I think something that most of you, I'll bet you, have never seen. I'll bet you've never really seen it. In Hebrews chapter 11, it talks about Moses. What does it say about Moses? That he left the riches of Egypt for the reproach of Christ. And stop right there. For the reproach of Christ. What do you mean he left Egypt? How could he know about Christ? That was a pagan country down there. How in the world could he have known about Christ? Said he left because of the, he, he, he thought the reproach of Christ was of more value than the riches of Egypt. How could that be? I'll tell you how it was. He was born. Pharaoh said, kill the Hebrew babies. His mother put him in a reed basket, placed the basket in the Nile. Down comes to the river to bathe. Pharaoh's daughter, she finds the basket with a baby. No, she needs to have a Hebrew mother. She directed to Moses' mother. Isn't that a gift of God? Moses' mother knew that the prophets were preaching about the coming of Jesus, because that's what the Bible says, that the sermons about Jesus started with Abel and his blood sacrifice. First prophecy about the suffering of Jesus is in Genesis chapter 3 where the serpent shall bite your heel and bruise your heel and the head shall be crushed. And his mother, when he was a boy, told him about Jesus. I think that's where it came from. And look what Moses did. He went out and became a great man of God. Did he suffer? Yeah, he suffered. Boy, did he ever suffer trying to lead people out of the land of Egypt who didn't even know whether they wanted to be led or not. Don't you know there were times he was frustrated? You look in the Bible and find it. All through the story of the exodus of the Jews out of the land of Egypt into the promised land, over and over again. Moses must have looked back and said, God, why am I the one that you chose to lead them out? I don't like any of this. These people are stiff-necked. They don't like what I'm doing. They don't have confidence in me. They don't even want to follow me. They want to be back in Egypt as slaves. They'd rather be slaves in Egypt as to suffer. I don't like any of this, God. So you see, it's not only Isaiah dealing with the Jews going into captivity at Babylon and then being released, but it's also a story about you and about me. It's a story about us that when we make a stupid, stupid, stupid decision and at those times God has to correct us or punish us and then he forgives us and then he says, I don't want you to think about it anymore. Where is that in the Bible? Look at Isaiah chapter 43. And verse 18, remember ye not the former things. Once it's all over, that's what he's talking about. Once I've got you back to Israel, remember ye not the former things. Neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall bring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And look at verse 25, a great verse. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. I'm going to blot out your transgressions. That stupidity, that thing that you keep saying, what if those times that you made a bum error in judgment, just said, I'm going to wipe it all out. 
So what should you do? If God's already done his part, now I'm talking to people that have got some regrets in your life. So now what should you do? Three things and I'm going to be quick about it. Number one, the first thing, you're going to have to forget it. You're going to have to forget it. Now let me explain what I mean when I say forget it. God said, I'll remember it no more. In another place, he says, I'll forget it. Now, God is God. God is omniscient. God is not God is not going to forget, forget as we think, forget. That is, erase it from his memory. He's not going to do that. And that's not what the word means in the Greek anyway. When the Bible says to forget, now listen to me, listen to me. In the Greek, it literally means don't give it weight or don't give it value. So you think about a bum decision, may have been a sinful decision, may not have been a sinful decision, but it's a decision that God had to intercede, intercede and cause some pain to get you out of that problem. Forget means at some point, you've got to understand, while it had an impact on your life back then, it is not having an impact on your life right now. Have you got that? Do you understand that? Do you understand it? You need to look at yourself and say, that thing that keeps me awake at night, that too many times I think about something I did that was stupid, something really bad. The only bad thing it's doing right now is keeping me awake at night and keeping me upset. It really has no value. It has no weight. It's actually not causing a problem now. Do you understand that? Because you need to understand something. Once God has forgiven you of that thing, especially if he's had to punish you and the punishment is over and he's forgiven you, if God has forgiven you for heaven's sakes, there's no need in bringing it back to your mind. Let it go. Just let it go. Number two, not only forget, don't dwell on it. Don't dwell on it. Now, let me tell you what people do, and some of you are guilty of doing that if you're not careful. Well, Brother Harold, I know God has forgiven me, but I can't forgive myself. You know what you're doing when you do that? you're putting yourself in a position higher than God. Now, now think about it a minute. You're putting yourself in a position higher than God. For God to forgive you, he had to trudge through, slog through terrible situations in the Old Testament fight battles, <laughs> live in constant, constant conflict with the people of Israel, his prophets and the kings, finally gets to the New Testament and has to give his own son at a cross to die and shed his blood to forgive you just one sin, not counting all of them. But here you are having all that great history of how much God loves you and how much he had to go through and how much Jesus had to go through to forgive you. And you have the audacity to say, well, I know he forgave me as though it's nothing. But in your mind, your sin is so big that even though God did all of that to forgive you, you can't forgive yourself. You need to, you need to understand something. You're not any more important than God. He said, I'll separate your sin as far as it is from the east to the west. 
He didn't say north to south. If it had said that, you go north on a globe do you get to the North Pole and then you're going south. Get to the south on a globe. Now you're going north. That's not true at the equator. You go east, you never go west. You go west, you never go east. That's how far God has separated your sins, your mistakes, your stupidity from you. When you're going to grow up and quit dwelling on it. So not only forget it, not only quit dwelling on it, Look again at what verse 19 says of Isaiah 43. Behold, I will do a new thing. Let me tell you, listen, this is the most important thing I'm going to say today. If you keep looking backwards at your regrets and the what ifs of your life, it's a good possibility you're going to miss the new things that God wants to do in your life. You get so busy looking backward you'll never see the plan that he has for you. Want a good example of that? Lot's wife. God only had one condition for their freedom from the judgment of God as they left Sodom and Gomorrah that God was about to destroy. He said, don't look back. But she did, turned into a pillar of salt. She looked back. I think the reason she looked back is she could remember the good times they had there. But don't look back. She can remember the times when they were financially profitable. Don't look back. She could look back at some great family vacations and parties and picnics down there. Don't look back. She could think of some friends that she had down there. Don't look back. She could think of that wonderful house they lived in. Don't look back. Don't look back. Whatever it is in your past that you regret not having today, regret not enjoying today, or if it's sins you committed or words you said, don't look back. Lot's wife never was able to see a future with her husband Lot and her family that could have been a very happy future far happier than what she had in Sodom and Gomorrah because she looked back. You got any what ifs? God told the Jews, once I punished you and once I've forgiven you, don't look back at what caused it all. Don't look back at your bad decisions, you that are Jews. We've dealt with it. I punished you. You've accepted the punishment. Grace has been extended, and I've forgiven you. It's time to move on. Can you do that? Heavenly Father, I pray you'll help our people to do it. In Christ's name, amen.